So since the theme of this is wonder, I'd like to touch base with that a bit. You know, we've been just talking about some really important issues, but I want to talk about how we get inspired with the oceans. And, and first of all, ask both of you how you got inspired. Now, Sylvia, you just mentioned that you got inspired as a kid. How did that happen, and when was your first dive? As a kid, I read the book called Half Mile Down by William Beebe. And I thought it was just the coolest thing in the world. It didn't occur to me that, as a girl, I shouldn't think about such things. I just dreamed. And I read Cousteau's books. And again, inspiration about what it must be like to go there. And I had parents who didn't discourage me and, and say, oh, you can't do that. Uh, it isn't just being a girl. It's being a kid and wishing to be able to fly or to climb mountains or do whatever. And now we have the ways and means to explore beyond books, which I truly love. And also there's that sense of urgency, not only that you can do things, but that we must use our power, whoever we are, whether you're a kid or a CEO, that we have an opportunity that is unprecedented because for the first time in all of human history, we know things that no other creature on Earth, including ourselves, could know before right about now. I mean, there's some smart creatures. Uh, some fish I know are really smart. <laughs> Elephants, <laughs> dolphins, whales, whatever. But they cannot see how old the Earth is. They cannot see what we're doing to the Earth. They can't see why it matters. They can't anticipate the way we can, the loss of the big fish, the loss of ice, the loss of our life support system. So that should be powerful inspiration to get busy. I mean, most of the world is unexplored. Most of it's blue. Yeah, as Don, you were just saying, the 90%. The and so how did, you, how did you decide to go from you know, being an airman and, and then deciding you fell in love with the planet? And, and wanted to be inspired by it. And how do you keep well, that going, both of you? How do you keep that going for so I, long? Stuff happens. Yeah. Um, I, of course, joined the Navy. I always wanted to be a sailor, and I did that. And then submarines seemed to be a good way to do that, went underwater. Then I heard about this bathy whatever, the Trieste, and uh, I thought that was grand, and I got into that. And um, I don't know, it, it just back into things. When I, I was working for the Secretary of the Navy, uh, in the Pentagon during sort of near the end of my career when I was given the portfolio for the U.S. Uh, Antarctic program, the Defense Department support of it. So I thought I'd better go down and see all it fits together. So I went down to the Antarctic and uh, saw all the elements together and I thought it was grand and um, subsequently I've made over 35 expeditions down there and have a mountain named after me. I'd much rather have a hole in the ocean but that didn't happen. And, uh, and then I went, first went to the Arctic when I was in the Navy back uh, about 50 years ago. And it's sort of habit for me. I've been up to the North Pole about five times and South Pole, worked, you know, expeditions, explorations. So it's sort of parallel lives, uh, undersea uh, technology operations as well as going to the polar regions. It's all hooked together, as, as she said. Uh, it's all part of one planet. You know. um, mm. And take us down a little bit. You went down to the Mariana Trench. How? What was that like? Well, what did the, you hear? Uh, the Trieste was, uh, you know, a very simple kind of machine. Bathyscaphe, by the way, means bathy, deep scaphos boat, deep boat. Bathysphere is deep sphere. Um, we had uh, the, the Picards, uh, Auguste and, and Jacques Picard, Bertrand's father, had built this thing in the early 50s, and it was offered to our Office of Naval Research as a scientific platform. And so when we brought it to the Navy Laboratory in San Diego, we were able to reconfigure it for research work. And um, we did about nine months of increasingly deeper test dives at the island of Guam before we went out and did the, the deepest dive. So it was, we sort of knew its moods and, and variabilities, reliability. And we, um, in January 1960, made the deepest dive. That was nine hours. Um, and about five hours and some change going down, half hour in the bottom, and then uh, half hour coming back up. No, I'm sorry, three hours coming back up. Um, people say, well, what did you see? We didn't see much because we landed on the bottom, we stirred up the bottom sediment. But we did see, just before we landed, we saw a fish, very important. 
That was a higher order marine vertebrate. It was a flat fish like a halibut or a sole. That means it lives there. There's one, there's more. Uh, that means there's food and oxygen for it. So all in glance, that told us that. And then um, after we got back up, it, uh, it was, as I say, 52 years later until Jim did it. Jim did it a very advanced a man submersible, and he did his whole dive in a couple of hours, three hours, something like that. And I was happy to be part of that expedition. But um, yeah, that was the beginning. It's 50 years from the time we did it till he did it. 50 years before we made our dive, the first airplane had just barely flown. So that gives you an idea of the march of technology and know-how. I'm, I'm sure that was a little, uh, well, I don't know. Like, was that discouraging that it took 50 years to go Absolutely. back and, and learn some more? Absolutely. I mean, people say, well, you just, this is a record thing. Not at all. It was, we were test pilots. We were doing an engineering test of the platform to make sure it was safe for scientists to use. And uh, so we're quite disappointed that uh, there wasn't a follow on. Now, there was, a, there were a lot of submersibles developed. Alvin, many of you know about the Alvin, very famous, probably the most productive manned submersible in the world in terms of science. But the really deep things just weren't being done anymore. It was rare that any submersible went deeper than, say, 20,000 feet. And our little dive of nine hours wasn't particularly long when uh, I made a dive on the battleship Bismarck uh, in a few years ago. That was a 14-hour dive. So we had lunch on the Bismarck because halfway through it, we landed on the ship and ate our sandwiches. Same thing on Titanic, it's two miles down. So I, obviously, I could speak with you both all day, but I think we're almost out of time. I have one thing I wanted to make sure also. For the folks in the, in the audience here and those who are listening, could you give one quick piece of advice, something they can personally do to make the uh, oceans better for all of us? What we can all do together as members of the crew, very quick. Imagine 50 years from now where we'll be if we fail to explore the ocean and to do what we can individually, voting with our fork, why are we eating ocean wildlife, and supporting protective measures around the world. In October this year, 50 new hope spots will be announced, places that cause reason for hope, that have been identified by an international group of scientists and others, if we apply our power, work with our government, work as individuals, to do for the ocean what we've done for the land in terms of parks. The best idea America ever had, some say, is to have national parks. Well, we need to do something like that, only more so in the ocean. The ocean truly keeps us alive. The ocean truly is in trouble. That means we're in trouble, but we do have the power. I mean, I started three companies to develop technologies to help advance our access to the sea. I love working with Google because it's technology to disseminate knowledge about what we learn. That's the key. Use your power. Great, so we'll use our power. Thank you so much, Don and Sylvia. It was just wonderful.